Good afternoon. My name is Malbert Smith, and I'm the president and co-founder of Metametrics. My role today is to serve as your host and moderator for this webinar. For those of you who do not know me or Metametrics, let me briefly describe our organization. Metametrics is a psychometric research firm located in the Research Triangle Park of North Carolina. Most educators know of us through the metrics we have created, the Lexile Framework for Reading, the Lexile Framework for Writing, and the Quantile Framework for Mathematics. Our websites, Lexile.com and Quantiles.com, provide free resources and tools for educators to use in promoting the growth of reading, writing, and math. So welcome to Hidden Resources at Your Fingertips, How to Uncover Rich Free Text Collections on Any Topic at Any Level. Let me first introduce our two speakers today. We're honored and privileged to have Meredith Lieben and Kathy Mansfield. I've had the pleasure of working with Kathy and Meredith for a number of years, and I'm excited they have agreed to share their knowledge, experience, and wisdom with us today. While many of you may have heard them speak before and may in fact know them, I promise to share one thing about each one of them that you probably do not know. So first, let me introduce Meredith. Meredith Lieben is the Director of Literacy and English Language Arts at the Student Achievement Partners. She works closely with states, districts, schools, publishers, and organizations working to ensure strong student learning through implementation of the Common Core State Standards. She worked on the Common Core State Standards for English Language Arts and ran the text complexity measurement studies that developed and validated tools for analyzing both quantitative and qualitative text complexity that is central to the Common Core State Standards. The one thing you probably do not know about Meredith is that three weeks ago, she became a grandmother. She has a beautiful grandson who this week turns three weeks old. So congratulations, Meredith, in becoming a grandmother. Kathy Mansfield is the library, media, and textbooks consultant for Kentucky Department of Education and former library media specialist of Heritage Elementary School in Kentucky. She was recipient of the 2013 Kentucky Library Association's Award and received the Kentucky Association of School Librarians Award of Merit in 2012. In 2002, Kathy was honored with the Jefferson County Outstanding School Media Library Award. She has worked in the school library field for 23 years. And for what you probably do not know about Kathy, she was a contestant and winner of the Wheel of Fortune in November of 2012. So thank you, Kathy and Meredith, for being with us today. Just a quick logistical, if you have any problems, there's a technical support number. And when you submit questions to the Q&A moderator, that is me, um, you can do that from the QA panel. And when submitting your question, please include your full name and organization. If we do not get uh, a chance to respond to your question today, we are going to be collecting all of the questions and sending out an email at the conclusion uh, of our uh, presentation. So uh, the agenda for today, in, in terms of today, is I will provide a brief, a very brief overview of why this topic is so important. And then Kathy will present specific examples of how state education leaders and local educators can find and utilize these digital resources at the classroom level. After Kathy's part, Meredith will stitch together all of the parts that Kathy and I have discussed to the Common Core State Standards. And you're gonna see a very close and tight alignment between the tools and resources we're using and how they support the Common Core State Standards. The interest in this topic has been tremendous. Uh, we have been, Meredith and Kathy and I have been meeting for a few weeks uh, about this, and this actually, the genesis of this webinar uh, was actually sparked by some conversations that I had last year uh, with Meredith about teachers' use of digital resources. Uh, you and your colleagues today, I was amazed to find out that we have 48 out of the 50 states represented in this call. We also have researchers and educators from 22 countries that have registered. Over 20 universities are on this call as well, and as well as 40 publishing companies have joined us as well. So clearly there's a lot of interest in this. I think you'll find this webinar a very content-rich and pragmatic resource. Tomorrow we will send each of you a link to the webinar, along with a summary of online databases by state a paper on this topic by David Lieben and Matt Copeland, 
and online resources to text complexity tools. So you'll have a number of resources tomorrow. And you may also want to email this to colleagues because we did um, completely subscribe to this webinar. So there were some that perhaps were not able to get on that uh, we will also make this available to them as well. We did a polling question um, that many of you were able to respond to. Uh, first of all, there were 23%. There was no response. Uh, of the ones who responded, 23% said, yes, I'm familiar with online text databases and I use them. 16% said you were familiar, but do not use them. And 38% said, no, I'm not familiar with online text databases, resources, and do not use them. So I think after today's session, uh, over almost 60% of you will know about databases that you didn't know about and perhaps start using some of these as great resources to get all students on a growth trajectory for college and careers. So what is the goal of public education? I love this quote from Secretary Arne Duncan. If we can dramatically increase high school graduation rates, if we can dramatically increase the number of graduates who are college and career ready, that's what this is all about. Everything's a means to that end. That's the holy grail here, or our students being prepared to be successful. Clearly, we as a country have coalesced around the goal of college and career readiness. If one did a Google quote, uh, actually, if I did a Google search back uh, two years ago on, on college and career readiness, and you can see there were only about a million five hundred thousand hits. September of this year, I did a Google search, and you can see we're close to 26 million hits. So clearly, it's in the in the vernacular. It's in uh, the media is talking about college and career readiness. Uh, educators are talking about college and career readiness. Even the states that are not adopting the Common Core have said they're all about college and career readiness. I had the privilege uh, Monday and Tuesday of this week of being an invited participant at NBC's Education Nation in New York. And the entire emphasis of that two-day conference that I was attending was on are we preparing our students for college and careers. So clearly this level of digital content is going to be hugely important for preparing all of our students for college and career readiness. As you know, the Common Core State Standards was really created to, to make sure that we were applying rigorous standards across the board so that students, when they did graduate, would be prepared to uh, be successful in colleges and careers. There are five major shifts in the English language arts of the Common Core that I want to touch briefly on, and you'll see when Kathy is presenting and Meredith, that they will touch on these issues as well. But I just wanted to frame it briefly in terms of previous standards movements. These are five big shifts uh, that haven't been reflected in prior standards movements and, and with the, uh, so many of you now moving from adopting the Common Core to implementing these Common Core standards, I just wanted to touch on them briefly. And also, you'll see in these five shifts why this content, these databases of digital content that's already been leveled in terms of text complexity is going to be hugely important for you. A, they've all been uh, measured on the Lexile scale. B, there's no better place for a treasure trove of fiction and nonfiction text than hundreds and hundreds of millions of articles that you will be able to access freely through these content aggregators. Three, analysis, inference, and evidence are hugely important. And again, I would submit to you that these resources that are freely available to you will be a great addition and a great uh, arrow in your quiver as you're managing the instructional resources in your classroom. Fourth, a major shift has been the importance of writing and speaking. I will not speak much on that today. And fifth uh, is the academic vocabulary is a huge part, as most of us recognize that one of the real um, uh, areas of, uh, that of need has been in this area of growing our academic vocabulary. I want to mention two things um, before I move on text complexity. If you go to Lexile.com, as thousands of teachers do each and every day, you can analyze on our, on, on our free Lexile Analyzer any text that you may want to submit. And educators every day and publishers come every day to our uh, website at Lexile.com for the Lexile Analyzer. In terms of the academic vocabulary, a tool we just uh, released that is absolutely free is that when you search for a book, you, can also, uh, you will also be provided a vocabulary list. So you'll get the words for that book that are um, at, that, at the same level of difficulty. One of the things that we'll be announcing next year that I think all of you will be excited about and releasing is a dynamic vocabulary uh, tool 
that will allow students to look up a book, but if there are three or 400 lexiles mistargeted, they will get a different vocabulary list than a student that is targeted for that book. So this will be a dynamic, this will be the first time in the, in, that this technology has been deployed. So we're really excited about that in terms of the future for academic vocabulary. But let me drill briefly on text complexity. Uh, here are the major findings from the text complexity side. Students who fall short of the ACT or the College Board SAT in terms of the readiness benchmarks have the greatest difficulty with test items involving complex text. Second major finding that's cited in the English Language Arts Appendix A is that over the last 50 years, the reading assignments uh, in K-12, with the exception or the caveat of advanced placement courses, the text complexity has become easier over the last 50 years. The third finding is that over that same 50 years, the text demands for what students will be required to read in college and careers has actually gotten higher. Hence, you have a gap that we've, that's been well documented and talked about by a lot of folks, and that, that gap has been denominated in lexiles. And the fourth finding there is that once you graduate from the K-12 and go into college, really there's not the time and the resources for scaffolding, so it's incumbent upon us and, and re, for us to make sure that all students are able to handle complex text throughout um, as they enter the post-secondary world. In terms of text complexity tools, you may have seen this before. Uh, you'll see in the center there, uh, if you look across the um, columns there, you'll see six text complexity tools. ATOS, Degrees of Reading Power, Flesh Kincaid, you'll see us, the Lexile Framework in the middle, and then Reading Maturity and Source Rater. You'll recognize that uh, the Lexile Framework, uh, those columns of text complexity grade bands or stair steps is the, what was originally in Appendix A. This uh, table came out later. Actually, Meredith Lieben was one of the scholars on this, and we were able to do a crosswalk so that other text complexities could be on the same level as the Lexile scale in terms of uh, being able to be used in identifying this. One thing I'll point out is that the text complexity tools, I love um, Stephen Covey's work on begin with the end in mind. We now know how well students need to read to be college and career ready. You see that 11th through college and career readiness, it's 1185 to 1385, and now this has been backwardly mapped down to the second grade, so you're able to tell by each grade level if a student's on college and career readiness trajectory. What's unique about the Lexile framework is that uh, unlike the other text complexity tools, we put the reader on that same scale as well. So just like we can measure text and give that a Lexile difficulty measure, we measure readers, and the way we measure readers are through existing tests. Today, there are uh, over 20 statewide assessments, the NCL best, NCLB assessments that report out Lexile measures. Every norm reference test publisher reports out Lexile measures, most formative test publishers. So there's a number of ways that you can get a Lexile measure. Uh, we also now, on the tech side, have 60,000 websites, over 170,000 books. And today, what we're going to be talking about are the hundreds of millions of articles that are in these online aggregators in terms of text complexity. So once you know a Lexile measure on a student, uh, you can also then find resources, and this is going to be hugely important as we try to move students up that staircase of text complexity. It's important not only that you know where the text is, but where the reader is, and the Lexile framework provides that on a vertical scale, which is going to be hugely important in those states that are looking into measuring growth. Uh, here are the content aggregators and catalog um, uh, automation tools that report out Lexiles, and depending on the state you're in, but you can see uh, uh, on your left the content aggregator partners as well as the catalog automation partners. This is a, you will get this tomorrow, we actually will send out this in a database, but you, depending on uh, which state you're in, you can look and see what your state database link is, what resources that are available through that state database link, and what content aggregators are available. So this will be a he very helpful tool for all of you that will be uh, available uh, tomorrow uh, afternoon on your website uh, when we email you. Last, as I turn this over to Kathy, I just, uh, I, I'm struck by how many times we talk about adopting the Common Core, and it looks like it's about 12 million to 2 million hits in terms of implementing. Adopting is a lot easier than implementing, and what we're about today and what Kathy and Meredith are going to explain to you are some of the tools that we can use to implement the Common Core state standard. So, Kathy, I will turn it over to you now. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. As the library media and textbooks consultant for the Kentucky Department of Education, I serve as a liaison to the Kentucky Virtual Library, or KYVL, 
which is facilitated through the Council on Post-Secondary Education. Enid Wolstein is the director, and you'll see her contact information at the bottom of this slide. My involvement with KYVL includes helping to spread the word about their valuable online databases to our K through 12 schools. I do that through regular communications with our Kentucky school librarians. And this works out great here in Kentucky because we have a law that requires a certified librarian for every school. So the goal is for the information to be shared with librarians at each school, and then they in turn share information about these online databases with the teachers and students that they serve. On the next slide, you'll see recent usage data for our public and private K-12 schools in Kentucky. We have 173 school districts, but only 112 of them subscribe this year to the databases that this data represents. Since Kentucky Virtual Library, or KYVL, operates on a fee-based model, not all districts in our state have chosen to subscribe. Out of the districts that did subscribe last year, you can see that over 4 million searches were conducted by our K-12 students and teachers. That's absolutely incredible. Teachers are clamoring for appropriate text to use with students. And more and more are recognizing the value of the amazing resources we're sharing with you today. One way that KYBL promotes its databases to K-12 schools is a tie-in to Kentucky Core Academic Standards. Kentucky adopted the Common Core State Standards for ELA and Mathematics, so the KYVL librarians created a handy-dandy resource that you'll see on the next few slides that helps show which databases in KYVL can provide tech supports for particular ELA standards. This slide gives guidance to our K through 5 folks. You see an ELA standard in the middle column and then links to KYVL resources that can help support the implementation of each of those standards. The next two slides show those same helpful links for grades 6 through 12. And in fact, on the second page of the 6 through 12 document, you see tie-ins to literacy in the content area um, that we have as part of our standards. Enid Wolstein and Betsy Hughes from Kentucky Virtual Library said they were happy to share the links to these tools for any of our listeners to adapt and use, and you'll see those links at the bottom of this slide. Several of our districts have chosen to subscribe to KYVL based on the realization that so many tech supports, searchable by Lexile levels, are available for their students. Today we're going to take a look at some of those ways to search for text by Lexile levels. So let's take a look um, at the next slide. Last year, I served as a librarian in an elementary school. And I discovered that most of the teachers at that school really didn't know what KYVL was or how to use the databases it offered. So I provided after-school trainings to introduce a few of the elementary level databases to them. One of these is pictured here, as shows Student Research Center. You'll see lots of different types of text that students and teachers can access. Magazines, newspapers, books and encyclopedias, even radio and TV news transcripts and primary source documents. Near the bottom of the slide, you'll see where the user can limit a search by Lexile reading level ranges. If you're an educator, then you know most classes have lots of different reading levels represented. So the ability to search for text by Lexile reading level ranges is a huge deal. Next, you'll see Grolier Multimedia Resources. On the left sidebar, you see the new book of knowledge, which is geared towards elementary school readers. Then Grolier Multimedia Encyclopedia and Encyclopedia Americana, those are aimed at older students. And Amazing Animals of the World is especially good for elementary students because of the colorful photos and the videos and, and shorter text sections. I used these Grolier databases quite a bit with fourth graders last year who were researching various organisms. It had really good um, user interface and made searches easy for them. I circled the advanced search in the upper right of this screen. When I click that, 
the next screen pops up. Here I can narrow my search on a topic by Lexile ranges, just like with Student Research Center. The next slide shows Kids Search from EBSCO. Kids Search is more for primary students, and you can tell by the way it's, it's laid out here on the screen. And it includes a Lexile search feature too. I've circled Detailed Search, which takes you to search limiters, one of which is Lexile Reading Level. By the way, the magazines that, are, that these texts come from include Ranger Rick, Highlight, Scholastic News, all those great periodicals we've used with students for years. But instead of flipping through stacks of magazines, you just point and click. I like being able to search by Lexile ranges to really discover those texts that students can best comprehend. Next on today's list is Novelist. Novelist is a reader's advisory for teachers and librarians and parents to locate fiction books. Again, we see the advanced search feature that circles, which allows a search by Lexile ranges. And on the next page, you'll see even other options of narrowing your search. Um, grade level, uh, publication date. You can even get into um, more specific type searches using um, Boolean methods. Novelist also provides book study guides, picture book extenders, and content-specific book lists, all sorts of resources to help connect students to books. Well, that's a quick look at some of the main databases I used last year in the school where I serve. And here's a real live example from that school year. There was a group of fifth grade teachers from our district that got together. They were planning a unit on the Revolutionary War. And they decided, based on looking at the standards, that they wanted the students to analyze some sort of primary source text. And they wanted to make sure that they were um, helping the students look at text toward the top end of the Lexile range indicated for college and career readiness for that grade level. After a bit more discussion, I discovered the teachers really wanted to find a first-person account. And then when I asked for suggestions of historical figures, the first one they mentioned was Paul Revere. So I said, well, that's the one we'll use, so off we went on the search. First, I went to Student Research Center, and I entered Paul Revere in the search box. Then I chose primary source documents, since they wanted a first-person account. And as you can see, I could just uncheck all the other options, like the magazines, newspapers, biographies, and just select primary source documents. Then I chose the grade one to five reading level. That's a really wide range indicated here on this um, search tool. But I knew I, was, I would be looking for something close to a 900 Lexile from the search results. So I chose that particular range. And here's what popped up. Let's go to the next slide, and you will see a first-person account by Paul Revere himself. And the text measure was 910. How perfect is that? It was exactly what the teachers were looking for. On the next slide, you'll see the full text. Well, it's, well you'll see at least the part that fits on the slide. And you'll see links to the citation for this resource. Very important, since we want students to practice citing their sources. And you see links for printing, emailing, and saving the text. The other cool thing about this just right find was that at the bottom of the text, which you'll see on the next slide, was a link to an additional text on the topic. And I did not know that was going to pop up. But all of a sudden, there at the bottom was another first-person account, but from the opposite side, from the British side. I couldn't believe that this um, amazing resource was right there at our fingertips. And you'll see the beginning of that text on the next slide. You see the date there and the language that's used in this first-person account. Now, for this particular text, you'll see on the next slide where it indicates the Lexile text measure for it. And it was 1490. 
Now, remember, the Paul Revere text was measured at 910, which was in the range that our teachers were looking for. But this particular text, this new one that popped up, was really cool because it could be used as an enrichment text for some of the students with higher reading levels to compare two different counts of the same event. So, I mean, just two just right texts found in just a few clicks. That was just amazing. As I mentioned earlier, these database resources were new to most of the teachers and students at my school. I found the best way to introduce the resources to students and to parents was just simply encouraging them to explore. The kids really liked looking for animals using Grolier's Amazing Animals of the World. And they discovered strange creatures they had never heard of before. They also looked up animals they had seen at the zoo or on trips or, or animals they had read about. EBSCO even provides scavenger hunt type activities for librarians to use with students to help them learn how to search the databases. So we did lots of just exploring, becoming familiar with these resources. And this exploration helped my students later in the year when they had specific topics to research. For teachers, they didn't always have time to just sit and explore. So finding just right text for them was the big hook. Those fifth grade teachers I mentioned earlier were right there when I was doing that search. They realized very quickly that a wealth of text was available to them at any moment with just a few clicks of a mouse. So by showing them how I found that one text, or actually two texts, for that assignment, they were off and running to find exactly what they needed the rest of the school year. I encourage anyone listening today to explore and play and become comfortable looking for resources in whatever online databases are available to you because you're going to discover wonderful nuggets of text that you will be able to use right away. Now, let's hear a bit more in depth about why these resources are so vital to the implementation of ELA standards. Meredith? There are a library in every single school. That uh, boggles my mind. I think that's a great thing. Uh, I relied on these databases heavily when I was the sole English teacher in a career in tech high school, where I taught until 2011. Uh, the students were studying so many diverse areas that I really had to have almost unlimited access to a wide variety of material to meet their interests. And a lot of it was foreign to me, uh, given more, my more humanist background. I didn't really know how to access articles on welding and sanitary food preparation and, and articles like that, but I found that unlimited access and variety in these same databases. So that made me uh, a convert with a lot of zeal around spreading the word about these. And with the advent of the Common Core State Standards, of course, everywhere I go, I get asked for resources, and what are we going to use with the kids? Well, here they are, 900 million or something articles that are updated almost by the second uh, on every topic conceivable. So it's really is a, it really is a treasure trove. So my goals in this, in this portion of the webinar are the following. I want to tie the data, this database access information to its roots in the Common Core State Standards themselves. And then I want to make the case for why accessing this trove of resources is vitally important for children. Uh, I want to look at several practical curriculum implications or, or applications, really, for these databases of articles. And then I just want to point out some other projects that are already up and going or are about to start uh, where people who are interested could be involved or tap into these other projects for free and open access to materials that tie into these resources or, or are also using them. So I'm a big believer in the common and the common core state standards, meaning that we can pool our efforts and, and work together and contribute together to the welfare of children. And I'm hoping that that case gets made this morning, this, this afternoon. 
I also want to quickly say to echo Kathy that the best professional learning, about the best professional learning I've been involved in was when I just showed teachers quickly, as Kathy just did, how to get on and navigate the, web, the websites, the various databases, and then have them hunt for resources for a topic they had brought into the training that they were going to be teaching soon, and just invite them to hunt down the resources to, pre, to map out that next topic or that next unit of study. Teachers will be thankful to any, any, any administrator or coach who makes that opportunity available to them. So take a look at the screen. I'm getting off my proselytizing ladder. And um, uh, this is Anchor Reading Standard 10. It is in a category by itself. And the category is underlined. It is range of reading and level of text complexity. There's a version, of course, for every grade from second through 12th grade. Uh, addressing text complexity. And we all tend to call it the text complexity slide and talk about the importance of text complexity for the standards. And that is true. If we look, but there is a key note about standard 10 that's really important to focus on. It's written in the sidebar to the right every time this, the anchor standards appear. I, I copied it for you on the next slide so you can read it. Oh, the slide after this, sorry. So text complexity, I'm no, sorry, I'm, I'm, well, yes, read this now, and then I'll go backwards. Thank you. This may be the most important part of the standards that nobody is paying enough attention to. This, really taught, this is called the note on range and content of student reading. So if we can go backwards to the slide I happily jumped over. Um, text complexity is necessary. It's really important. It's important in the Common Core, and Malbert made the case earlier why it's so important in our society and for children to grow into the adults with the options in life and, and the educational range and, and abilities that we want for them. But we do need that range half of standard 10, too. We cannot, we cannot set that aside. We would do that at our peril. Reading small amounts of complex text very closely and intensively is not enough by itself to give students everything they need. There has to be this range and volume of reading made available to them. And kids have to be able to read it for themselves. Teachers can't, can't always be close by them. That may be appropriate in close reading for a long time, but for volume and range, students have to be able to access it themselves to build toward independence. And maybe most important of all, the standards are for everybody. And to reduce the achievement gap we've been suffering with as long as we've noticed it, probably forever, we do need to do more. To develop students' vocabulary, their, wor their world knowledge, and to help them take pleasure at learning from text, and then to develop their reading muscles and their stamina, they need to read a lot, and they need to learn to read independently. So we're going to skip past that long quote, but I am going to refer back to it. So how important are reading volume and range in the standards? That text that was quoted on the, the slide you read before appears in quite a few places on the standards documents, and they're listed here. They're on page 10, where the anchor standards for reading first appear. And then all of page 33 is not this quote, but it is concerned with building knowledge systematically. And that, that page with the human body example that many of you may be familiar with is hugely important to executing on the Common Core Standards in ELA. That exact same quote is repeated again for the, when the 612 standards appear, which is on page 35. And then when the history, social studies, and science technology standards appear on page 60 with the anchor standards in front of them, that quote is there again. So that is a lot of repeating of that quote uh, for emphasis. Then in Appendix A, which makes the, is the research base for the ELA standards, pages 2 through 10, a quarter of the document, talk about building knowledge and this notion of range and volume of text. That is a quarter of the document, along with text complexity. and then. All of Appendix B, which offers sample titles to give people a sense of what kinds of, of what the range of texts that would be available for Common Core like reading. It is not a reading list, but it certainly shows 
um, the range and types of text, that really is a case for volume and range, wide-ranging reading as well. So it is hugely emphasized in the, in the structure of the Common Core and the content of the Common Core itself. And, and again, with this range issue, finding appropriate text and getting kids to read it, you could argue, well, and anybody who's a teacher on the call could argue it's just as big a challenge as helping students read complex text with facility. So still making the case for how important reading volume and range are. Informational text provides a greater variety of rich academic vocabulary than, literary text, than literature can alone. Academic vocabulary is another heavy emphasis of the standards. By my calculation, it's about 16% of all the ELA literacy standards when you read all the strands. Why is it such a big emphasis? Because of its crucial importance in being able to read complex text and because it is a huge cause of the achievement gap. And I just want to remind everybody of what you're probably familiar with, Hart and Risley's study of the 30 million word gap is one of the most compelling pieces of research, I think, in, in, in all of reading academia. And it may, it, may, it may propel a lot of us in our work on a daily basis. I think that that, that study um, shocked almost all of us into action. But reconfirmed recently, as recently as 2012, um, a NAEP study found a really strong correlation between, the, between vocabulary and uh, special vocabulary subtests they did and the reading comprehension results. Really strong correlation. Reading a lot is definitely the best way to grow a large vocabulary. Getting all students to read a lot is our best chance to close that achievement gap. Moving on to the research and the recent attention that boys and types of reading boys tend to, tend to be drawn to also supports a broad range of reading exposure. Then there's text structures. Text structures of informational text types uh, are more varied. Informational text has many more varied text types, and they tend to be more challenging, those types, harder for students to grapple with. And finally, college and career readiness requires people to be able to read informational text in all kinds of settings and on demand We're using a huge variety of text types, and they need to be, they need to be comfortable doing that. They have to be exposed in order to achieve this. So moving on, that's part of the case. I want to move into the other purpose of this is, okay, you've accessed that article database. You've navigated around it. You get an idea of how to search it and how to, how to control for what's important to you. What are you going to do with it? This is the first of four slides that are going to concern themselves with this. Of course, you can simply use these articles to connect the student interest for independent reading. You can also, as Kathy said, use them to, en to enhance and expand your classroom content. These are available to subscribers and in most cases either public libraries, even if your school systems have had to drop their subscriptions, public libraries invariably uh, subscribe to one or more of these databases as well. And your public librarians are, would, if you don't, don't, if you're not in Kentucky and you don't have a school librarian anymore, the public librarians would be happy to show you how to access these and to give you your, your passwords and, and information. So students can read, read in this kind of um, independent reading program, and we're, we've been talking a lot with teachers about the need for an accountable independent reading program. While many students gladly engage, as we know, in independent reading, there are some, just a few, students who may need to be helped into the habit by being held accountable for what they read. But, but that, while that's no easy task in education, helping those students find articles they find compelling would certainly help with that heavy lift. But in any case, whether you're using them for classroom use or, or independent uh, student reading and, and trying to get students to read what they're interested in, these databases increase the amount of informational text available to you by an almost unlimited magnitude. So moving to the second slide on this, the ability to link articles to your classroom content, as this says, can expand the learning of that content for students a lot. So this is more just simply offering range of articles. Some of you on the webinar may be old enough to remember the reserve rooms 
from the pre-internet age when instructors, college professors, or maybe AP instructors would leave additional readings on reserve at the, at the library that everybody was supposed to cycle through and read. And what that provided was extension beyond their lecture and beyond the other classroom readings, the assigned readings, that would, that would build on knowledge that, was ex that you were being exposed to in class. So this extension of classroom learning outside the walls, beyond the walls of the classroom could be exploited to extend learning beyond the walls and the, and the school day on topic building knowledge, enhancing vocabulary. That would be a good thing. And this access is available once students know how to do it. They can get on if they have internet access at home or at their public library or neighborhood centers. They can go there and have the world at their fingertips. So that can be connected directly to class, class knowledge building. So moving on to the third slide on this, what do you do with all these articles? We've been, we've been working, and this work is increasing a lot because there's a lot of interest, this idea of a gradated text set, and that's just a name for it. Um, and the, the notion of that would be you start, just as it says here, articles start below grade level, and it could even be below, you know, on, the, on whatever measure you're using, Lexile range or whatever, um, where everybody in your class can access the information. And then you have a series of articles on that topic that move upward beyond grade level, potentially. You could potentially go high above it. Because everybody's so knowledgeable about the topic, they could independently read complex text, maybe even above their um, tested level on that topic. They become content specialists. And I've sort of dubbed this in my own head the first grader's dinosaur effect. When kids in first grade become obsessed with dinosaurs and they're, they're reading, decode, not only decoding, but comprehending uh, articles about triceratops or or Diplodoctus that they have no, they really have no business being able to read or understand, but there they are talking about it at dinner or talking about it to whoever will listen and, um, and learning a whole lot about dinosaurs because they have, they're tracking their own obsession. Now, Tom Landauer's work has shown that learning new words is four times more effective, defined as you learn four times as many words for keeps. When uh, somebody is reading a series of texts within a topic as when they're reading in a more scattershot fashion. So just to recap the value we're seeing here with these articles and, and this idea of a gradated text set or even just a text set that clusters around a topic, vocabulary is a vital component in reading comprehension, especially so when the text gets more specialized and complex. Vocabulary gaps between students, between different kids with different backgrounds is an enormous problem. Vocabulary is also the focus of fully 16% of the Common Core ELA standards. And then you have this finding, that reading on a topic can yield four times the word gains, the vocabulary gains, than reading randomly. So I think people, when they hear about gradated text sets, are pretty, find it pretty compelling. And on the resources page that will come at the very end of the webinar, you'll see um, some links to groups that are doing this. The Council of Chief State School Officers is, um, has a group that specializes in ELA. It is, I think, 22 states come together um, quarterly to work on the Common Core in ELA, and they have launched a text complexity and text set site um, where they've shown roadmaps and sample text sets, and they are inviting people to join them in this work and build out more and more text sets on, co on, um, on commonly, um, commonly taught topics. And there's a link to that you'll see at the end of these materials. Um, Student Achievement Partners, the group that I work with, is also launching a new initiative. Uh, it's a read aloud project for kindergarten through second graders, and we're going to work on that with district writing teams co uh, collectively and share all our work. But we're also going to group those read alouds and build out text sets on all those read aloud topics so that even students in K first and second grade can have access to this kind of systematic knowledge building on a topic. And then on this fourth, um, you do the, some other principles of building these text sets. You do have to start with a broader handling of the topic, and there has to be sort of a general overview. Um, you can't get technical right away. And then you build up as the texts get more complex. They can also get more and more specific. 
and narrow because students have, have knowledge to build on. And you'll be amazed at how, much, how quickly they can read harder material. But I do, there is, there's a teacher responsibility or a, a text selection responsibility here. You can't just plunk down a bunch of articles whose titles sound promising because people who write journal articles or, or popular articles are really good at making the titles sound promising. You, you do have to read at least the synopsis, if not the whole article, to determine the suitability of the articles you're selecting for what your goals are and who your students are. And I want to just call to mind that text complexity triangle that names the ingredients of, of text selection for the common core. It's uh, three-sided. It's an equilateral triangle. I want to emphasize that. All sides are equal. And that has quantitative measures, such as lexiles and that chart we saw earlier. Uh, and it has qualitative text features that are important to consider. But that third leg is what I want everybody to think about, that professional judgment side called matching reader to text. That's the third side. You do have a responsibility to choose carefully. And one final thing I want to say about the gradated text sets is that they actually simultaneously address both sides of standard 10. If you remember the heading of that it's range and complexity, they address both volume, because kids are reading a lot independently, so on, on ranging topics. And if you go up and more and more gradated, they address complexity. All the students are reading more complex texts as they build comfort and familiarity on a on topic, so that that dinosaur effect can kick in on topic after topic. So just to sum up before we turn it over to Malbert uh, to field questions, your ability, and Malbert said this already, your ability, ability to access and navigate these databases is a vital tool in your Common Core toolbox. It does not cost anything more than internet access, which you can do at your public libra library with the public librarian assisting you, even if, as I said, you're not lucky enough to have your own school librarian. And then after you get comfortable and learn to search and navigate and get a feel for the various filters and search mechanisms, let your students loosen those databases. Let them find articles that they're interested in and want. And if you aren't tech savvy, let your students go first, and they'll show you how to navigate it, if nothing else. So thank you so much for taking part, and I think we're going to field questions now. Thank you, Meredith, and thank you, Kathy. Um, uh, this has been an, uh, a very fun webinar, and I think of one very rich in content. Um, we're going to, we've been answering questions as they've been coming in real time. Uh, I would like to, to footnote or, or punctuate a couple of points. As we said earlier, the goal of public education now is college and career readiness. And if we're going to prepare our students for college and career readiness, this is the most ambitious goal we've had in public education. No time in the history of our country have we graduated every student and then added the, the criteria that they would be college and career ready. But no country in the history of the universe has ever done this. So I'm really excited about where we are. And I think these kind of tools uh, and resources that Meredith and Kathy described are going to be hugely important as a quiver in the arrow uh, of the bags of, of our teachers in terms of the instructional resources. The polling question uh, earlier today, 54% of you indicated that you were not currently using any of these databases. So I, hopefully today we've whet your appetite at least to explore more how you can use this treasure trove of content that touches fiction, nonfiction, that will help grow the academic vocabulary that has been leveled in terms of its text complexity on the Lexile scale. And one of the things that I did not mention earlier is each and every day there's more content because every day there are more articles coming out. So it's a very dynamic and growing uh, uh, volume of, 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 of text uh, that teachers can freely access. Um, one of the questions that we received was about the vocabulary resource on Lexile.com. Today, if you go to Lexile.com, about a third of our books, you're able to do a vocabulary search, and it's called Power Vocabulary. Uh, we will, uh, over the next few months, have all of the books available in terms of the um, vocabulary resource. And then next year, we're going to have this dynamic vocabulary resource that will allow different students at different Lexile levels to get a different vocabulary list from the same book. Because if I am a, a student, that, and especially this would be applicable as uh, Meredith was describing these gradated texts, 
imagine a student that's 600 lexiles beneath the text complexity or one that's 400 or 200, their vocabulary needs will be very different. And instead of giving a static vocabulary list for the range of these readers, each reader could have a different and unique vocabulary list that's tailored to the difference between the text complexity and the reader ability of that student. Um, also, I want to share with you right now, as we're, uh, we're running out of time, let me share you with you what you're going to get tomorrow. We're going to respond to each question um, by email, and we'll also send out a group email as well, but we're sending out individual emails uh, to the people who are, are sending in questions right now. But I want to be cognizant of our time, um, and we're running short of time. Uh, here are the resources that will co come to you tomorrow in an email. Uh, you will have uh, a link to this webinar. Number two, you will have a summary of the online databases, which you saw a glimpse of uh, in the first part of the presentation. But by state, you can look and see what the resources are, uh, what are the content aggregators, and you'll have that by state. Uh, number two, this is a very helpful resource that Kathy was able to find for us, and this is a tutorial on Boolean logic. As you're doing these search routines, uh, you use Boolean logic in terms of narrowing your search or expanding your search, and this is a great resource uh, that's a tutorial for you as well. The third um, uh, uh, part that you'll receive will be a paper that's been written by Matt Copeland and David Lieben that really is a narrative of what we presented today. How can teachers find and utilize digital content that's been leveled to respond to the heterogeneity of a classroom. And you, that uh, article by Lieben and Copeland is a, a great article that will help you through that. And then Meredith mentioned uh, this resource uh, from SCAS at, at the Council of Chief State School Officers called Navigating Text Complexity. Excellent resource. You'll get a link to that, and that will help you as well. Uh, again, on our website, you can measure text uh, anytime you want to. It's a free resource. Thousands of educators use it daily, and uh, but a lot of times you can find these resources. Uh, you don't have to measure them. They're already measured for you uh, through these online databases. The last but not least, as I am running into the last couple of minutes here, um, I wanted to share with you that uh, we do have a, um, uh, a professional learning services group here. Uh, uh, we may... Uh, I'm amazed at how well we've pulled off this PowerPoint. We have um, Meredith is in, uh, just flew back from Seattle. She's in Vermont. Kathy's in Kentucky, and I'm here in the Research Triangle Park of North Carolina. And except for a couple of fumbles, I think we've done this PowerPoint uh, uh, pretty well. And uh, here's the last slide uh, that I wanted to share with you. If you want a deeper dive into these instructional uh, online databases, we have a professional learning team here at Metametrics that can help you uh, customize any of the training that you want for any of the resources we've talked about, can do workshops on all of the digital content that's available to you that's been leveled, also can help you with the resources that are freely available at Metametrics on the Lexile.com uh, website from the vocabulary tools to the find a book to the summer loss campaigns. So that's all available to you there as well, so uh, feel free to email us on that. We're also thinking about, their, uh, and we will let you know, uh, as I said earlier, this was oversubscribed. Uh, we actually had more subscriptions than, than we had anticipated, so be, feel free to pass this along to your colleagues who may not could have gotten in. And secondly, we're going to plan on doing a part two uh, sometime early in the first quarter of 2014. Again, I want to thank Meredith and... Um, Kathy, for their time, and we will get out the Q&A uh, response as well. And if you have any questions uh, at any time, don't hesitate to reach out to uh, the folks at, uh, here at my organization at Lexile.com um, because we really want to be a partner with you as you are trying to get every student on a growth trajectory for college and career readiness. Uh, thank and you Albert, for being with us. Albert, if I could just jump in at the end yes. here. I, um, I, always, I wanted to make another call out for accessing your school librarians. I just I found out that not everybody heard you know my, my, my wistful desire that we could all be Kentucky and have a, a school librarian required by legis, legislative mandate in every school. But they are the, con, the common core state standards were made for school and public librarians. They are ready and trained to do this work with us, and um, you know. If we're not all so lucky as, as Kentucky, but I can go in Vermont to my my town library and have and get help there. So 
I do want to I want to say there are there are leaders in this work, and um, we we ignore their expertise at our great sorrow and our children's loss. Well said, Meredith, and I couldn't agree more strongly. We uh, just a footnote to that: um, not any of the librarians, uh, public or school librarians that are on uh, line with us right now. Uh, the one of your premier magazines is a magazine called Knowledge Quest. And we have an article that will be appearing in Knowledge Quest, uh, we think in January, on the Common Core, because if Meredith is exactly right. Uh, there's never been a time in where the library is going to be a more important partner to the classroom. And some of these resources that we talked about today are excellent bridges from the classroom to the library. Uh, so again, thank you for your leadership, Kathy, and, and showing us how it's done, uh, connecting a library to a classroom and educators. Thanks, everyone, for being a part of this today. Thank you.